she has uh, a head make and shape that doesn't require a lot of, oh, well, we've got to hide this or cover that or, um, but her head is small in balance to her body, uh, so you don't want to overpower it with hair. Um, and again, remember the standard says plentiful as opposed to profuse. Right now, we got profuse. So um, that's fine. When you're working furnishings, uh, you are best off to work them continually so that you don't have to try and go from profuse but kind of all the same length to plentiful, which implies not overly long, but you want the density so that you can do the, the sculpting part of it. Uh, if it's too long uh, and you try and pull out the length uh, all at once, you're going to end up with sparse and stringy. So that's why when you're working a coat, you don't want to neglect the furnishings. While you're working that coat, you're working the furnishings too. It's not like a schnauzer where you're going to be scissoring the furnishings for the most part, so it really doesn't matter. Um, you've got to uh, be working those furnishings the whole time. And I'm hoping we'll have a chance to work on one of the babies in a little bit because where furnishings are concerned on young puppies, I'm ruthless. Uh, and the reason I'm ruthless is because regardless of what that puppy has by way of leg and face hair, it's not anything you're going to want to preserve. And the sooner you get rid of it, the sooner you're going to start getting real hair. Uh, basically, what I'm doing with Sophie now, and she's being very good and patient, is uh, just taking a layer uh, off her back skull and cheeks. This is something that you want to do. What knife are you using? I'm using a fine, uh, you know, it's one of any one of a number of the original pattern for these was made by Resco back in the 40s and 50s. Uh, and since then, we went through a period when there weren't any good knives, unless you had some old Rescos. Uh, I did have a set. Peter Green stole two of them. <laughs> when I worked for him. Um, but now it's not hard to get nice knives. You do need to be very, 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 very careful when you get new knives. Uh, almost invariably, they're going to have sharp edges. And you've got to either use them on coats that are no longer critical and dull them down that way, uh, you can dull them down when you're sitting of an evening sipping your martinis. Uh, you can sit there with a box of sand and just work the knife, raking it through the sand. And over time, that will dull them down. Knife is a bit of a misnomer in that uh, you do not, sharp is not what you want. You, the only place you want to cheat a little bit and perhaps cut some hair is a bit around the bottom of the feet. There you can get by with cheating a little. Uh, we can't really see what you're doing. 
yeah, I'm just doing the same thing on this side that I did on that side. Actually, I wasn't going to do that, was I? That gets left for the other guy. That's for Daddy to do. Well, I'm saying I do it on when I sort through my puppies at seven, eight weeks and decide what I'm keeping, anything that I keep, because they look like blazes after you do it. I mean, they're no longer, oh, how cute. Uh-uh. Yeah. Can you explain when you put in your blinds? Yeah. What I'm doing right now is uh, I'm, in essence, parting it right down the middle and combing off to each side. And this is a starting line for uh, this longer hair of the fall. Beginners often suffer from the misconception that the Lakeland Fall is long hair. It's not particularly. I mean, it's longer than if you're trimming one that has distinct eyebrows like a Welsh or a Wire or an Airedale. But uh, it's not really real long. Um, and so, and if you let it get real long, the first windy dog show, it's all blowing back over their ears and it looks like blazes. So you, you don't want to do that. Uh, you part it and you just, anything that sticks out beyond her cheeks, straight line down, comes off. So that's your starting point. And you do that from this top part, you do that all the way down to her nose. And um, since she is going to be shown, uh, I'm going to be relatively discreet here. Also, even if she wasn't, say this is a bitch that you're not planning on showing for six months. Perfect. You don't take it all off. You take off a little bit now, and you come back in two weeks, and you take a little bit more, and you come back in two weeks, and you take a little bit more. And, you know, two, three, four months down the road, then you've got this built up in layers, and it's those layers that are going to hold the shape. And that's true of their legs as well. What you want are layers of hair from very short to the longest hair. And uh, that's when the furnishings are going to hold together with a minimum of uh, enhancement. Now, I've basically, I've taken off as much as I'm going to take off of this right now. Now, for the little bit that I've taken off, look at the difference, one side to the other. When you stand at the front of the dog, judging it or looking at it, do you see the eyes from the front, the top, the side? You see the eyes certainly from the front, kind of tunnel vision. Uh, that you look in, now I haven't trimmed the corner of the eye yet. We're just talking you know, the fall here. Uh, and so the next step is I'm not going to do this side. I'm just doing the one side. Is to take all this and comb it straight back. So again, you're talking about you comb the hair, you take a little bit. You comb it again, you take a little bit. It's a gradual process. Don't be tempted to get in there and start yanking out tons of hair. Uh, you, you know, it's, it's a matter of subtlety. Also, it's helpful if you're trimming hair, just take the ear and fold it back over the neck, get it out of the way. And stop. So we've got this on the side all combed straight back. Again, I'm only going to start here by taking the longest hair. 
and I'm working in a, not in a straight line from the corner of the eye to the corner of the mouth, but rather in a curve. And uh, if you feel the dog's anatomy, there is a line of muscle that curves around the cheek and another that comes around here. There's a natural, to varying degrees, depending upon the dog's anatomy, a natural line that you can feel. And if you want to come up and feel it from the cheek down here. And as I was pointing out to Bob yesterday, uh, you need to be careful because as you're trimming this back, it's easy to get carried away and all of a sudden you're working in under the eye and you've got them hollowed out. Um, so I just took this longest hair, I know, honey, uh, and am taking it off. As it comes down to the jawline here, you don't want anything sticking down below the jawline. So I've, I'm going to still have some work to do here at the corner of the eye, but uh, for right now, this is as much as I'm going to take off here. I'm going to bring this up now so that I expose this line under here without taking off a lot more here. Because again, this is going to be an ongoing process as you build up the, the layers underneath her. Now I'm going to take corner of the mouth straight back and I'm going to take all of this off. You don't want any of that. Um, one, it's going to break this clean line under her throat. Uh, two, if she starts panting, this is all going to stick straight out and it's going to look like crap. So uh, you want to go to the corner of the mouth and take all of that out. all of it out below the jaw. And that is particular, well, it's important on all of them, but when you've got a dog with uh, a shorter head, if you don't take that out, they're not going to have any head at all. Uh, and they're going to tend to look very toyish and their muzzle is going to look unnaturally short. And their muzzles aren't supposed to be short. Uh, they're supposed to be in balance to the back skull. So again, it's not about too long or too short. You want them equal. So uh, you want to get all of that out. And then you just keep going down the chest. Now, also in conjunction with this lower jaw, they get on the lower lip a cowlick of hair right in this little groove behind the canine tooth. And very often, it's not particularly on her, but very often that hair right in there is very thick. And it tends to, it doesn't tend to get super long, although it can and it has in her. Uh, it's very thick and stiff and it tends to stick straight out. And you'll be combing and combing and combing and you'll think, why can't I get that to stay flat? Well, it's because of that. So when you're trimming the lower whiskers, it's not that you trim all the way up there from under here, but you got to get that wad of hair out of there. So you go in and you just take it out right in that corner and you kind of shape from back to front in this lower jaw. You 
want the hair on the chin whiskers to be sh a little shorter at the back and then getting gradually longer. It's not all the same length. Again, that's unlike some of like the softer coated whiskered breeds like uh, Carries and Schnauzers, uh, Wheaties, where it's pretty much straight line right across here and everything here is this long beard. Long beard is not what you're looking for. You want the face to look squared off and strong. So you don't want a big wad of hair under there. Do you start from corner of the mouth to corner of the mouth, or do you start from a little bit? Uh, it, depend, to it depends on the dog's head shape. Uh, if the dog has too long a foreface, you don't want to exaggerate that by taking it way far forward. You want to leave a little fuller, shorter whisker, both on the bottom and the sides. So shorter, thicker, and a little further back to make the head a little blockier looking. Uh, if the dog has a short head, then you want to come just in front of the corner of the mouth you want to clean out at the corner. Again, particularly, you become aware of that when they're panting. And uh, so you uh, want to be careful. Now, if you'll look at this, we've started to shape that. We've cleaned it out pretty much at the corner of the mouth and started to shape this so that it's shorter here and is getting gradually longer as you work forward as compared to the other side, which hasn't been trimmed. And you see you've got all this, and that's what you want to get rid of. This side. Turn around. That's what you want to get rid of, is all of that, so that it looks more like okay. Okay. like that. And that way, with this, as you build up shorter, thicker hair here at the back, it's going to tend to hold the whiskers forward. And uh, you won't need to be constantly, every two seconds, doing this, trying to keep it all together. It, as you build up those layers, they hold themselves together. So now still got a few. Now that we did under here, you notice we've got some tags here that have become apparent that we need to tidy up. And again, the temptation at this point is, oh, well, there's another taggy hair. I need to take that. Oops, there's another one. Oops, and all of a sudden, you've got nothing left. Uh, so be patient realize that you're not going to be able to go from this to perfect in one trimming. It's not going to happen. It's going to take several months. Trimming any broken coated terrier takes patience. And if you start doing shortcuts now, oh, well, I'll just go in that with a thinning shear. No one will ever see it. They will. And over time, you're going to soften the coat and... Uh, you're going to lose color, and then, all right, how much chalk do I use? Uh, be patient. Be patient. So what I do after I've got this shaped as best I can for now, and I've trimmed her cheek, you want to come under this. You're leaving this alone you want to take that curved line and come underneath it and clean out some of the taggy stuff that's underneath. And again, as that starts to come in again, you'll let that get just a little bit thicker here than it is back here on the cheek, and that's going to tend to hold this in place.
Now, last thing we do is we've combed, we parted it, combed it out to the side. We've combed it straight back on the side and trimmed. Now we're going to comb it all straight back. Isn't that cute? Don't you love that look? That's a windy day in the dark. Yes. And this is so that on the windy day, you don't end up with that look. Uh, this is going to help you give the shape to the eyebrows that you want because they are shaped. It's not all the same length. You make an imaginary line in a semicircle, not straight across, but a, a flattened semicircle. Now, some Lakelands have what I call the worry bones. Uh, they'll tend to have a prominent bone right here above the eye, uh, right, as, right at the stop. And this can vary in intensity from relatively obscure. Even on a nice flat-headed bitch like this, you can still feel it. It's the brow. And when it's correct, it is quite flat. And just you, your hand comes down here over the forehead, and you feel that brow, and then the, the slight stop onto the ridge of the nose. But in some dogs, this bone can be quite prominent. You can have a furrow in the brow that isn't, it's partly bone and partly muscle. Uh, it's a combination of both. Uh, it is most pronounced in the terrier breeds in, like, think of a staffy bull. You've got a very distinct uh, furrow right down the middle of the skull with muscle bulging on either side of it. Uh, and to varying degrees, even though it's undesirable, you're going to get it occasionally in Lakelands. Uh, and if you've got that and these brow bones are prominent, you need to be very, very careful in trimming this line. What some people tend to do is do it almost in a V with a very sharp demarcation uh, coming to a point here. It's then easy to get a hollow spot behind the brow. And it's common in Airedales where the planes of the head, instead of being parallel, one just slightly above the other, they come to a crown like this right above the br right at the brow, and they're almost down-faced. You don't often see that in Lakelands. You do see it in Airedales and occasionally in wires. Um, but uh, whereas you won't get quite that down-faced look, you will get these bumps. So you've got to factor that in and uh, be careful in your trimming to cover those with hair, but it's got to be very short hair. And it's got to be blended in uh, so that you really have to put your hands, your fingers right in those spots to feel them. Otherwise, they're not going to be readily apparent. Now here, this is quite long. I mean, heck, it goes practically halfway back to her occiput. You don't want that, especially on this little girl. So again, I'm not going to be able to take it all today, but we're going to take some of it. I draw my imaginary line and I figure that as much as I would like to try and make it perfect, uh, not going to happen. And don't keep working your way down 
in an effort to make it perfect or you're going to end up with nothing. And you say, okay, fine, well, then I start from scratch. No, because it's all going to come in at the same time. You want it coming in in layers, and that's why little bit at a time. Now, you notice the difference here as opposed to the other side. Now I'm going to come down around her eye. Yeah, who's that? Company. And come into the corner of the eye. At the corner of the eye, you want it very, 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 very short. You want it to come right to the corner of the eye. You don't want any hair sticking out beyond that. And uh, again, on her, there's going to be some little bit sticking out. You're not going to get it absolutely smooth yet. You also then, after you've trimmed this, then you can comb this off to the side again and just even this up a bit so that uh, she's got an eye there to see. Uh, again, if you've got a dog with either an eye that's a little light or an eye that's a little large, the idea is not to try and cover it with long hair and hide it. The idea is have the hair short and thick. It's going to do much more to diminish the size and deepen the eye set than having the hair long and in the way. Notice, too, I'm wearing this thumb thing. Uh, these are, it's office equipment. You can get it in any office supply store, and they're for sorting papers. Uh, I find it very useful. It really helps you get a grip on the hair. It does take a little practice to get used to using it, uh, but I find it useful because I'm not doing as much trimming as I used to, and so I don't have the calluses anymore and uh, it protects your thumb, keeps it from getting sore. So uh, that's just a trick that saves on blisters a bit. Also, if you don't have blisters and you ordinar or calluses and you ordinarily wear a ring on your trimming hand, take it off or you will have blisters. Uh, I've got calluses there that will be permanent, I think. I don't think they'll ever go away. So uh, I'm okay there, but it is another area that will tend to develop blisters. Uh, you can help prevent them. You can pad these handles with tape and, and uh, various cushioning if you are prone to blisters. Okay, so We've got this side basically shaped in now, except for this. This will be the last part we do. Uh, is it perfect yet? No, it's not. Uh, I'm not going to be eager to take a whole, I may take a little more of her eyebrow here because she's got a nice dark eye. I don't need to worry about it. Oh, what did you hear? Yeah, did you hear puppies playing? Um, and realize that that side hasn't been trimmed yet. But uh, you can see the difference. We'll still do this here as opposed to there. That you've got all this extraneous stuff that no matter how carefully, I mean, this has been combed on this side, what, constantly. Even if you try and comb it all forward, it's just not going to look anywhere near as neat and tidy as this side. And is that the amount of eyebrow that you would, or the amount of falling that hair that you would show her with? That's as much as I'm going to, I'm going to take some off here. But that's as much as I'm going to take off her today. 
Yeah. And then would it grow in more before she would be ring ready or that? Well, you can show her this way. Mm -hmm. It's not ideal yet. Okay. Uh, again, what your goal is, is to build up layers of hair. And those aren't, you can't make them happen. It just takes time. Uh, this, if you keep trimming on this, not taking off as much as I did today, but taking off just a few hairs at a time each time you trim her, um, you're going to build that up. And I would say in, if you keep working this two to three months, you're going to start having layers and it's going to be pretty well filled in. Now what I'm going to finish off by taking some off here and I'm also having, we combed this back and did it, now it's combed forward and I'm just going to take a few taggy hairs off this. Uh, the amount of fall that you leave is a matter of personal preference uh, and it does tend to evolve depending on which handler has a top winning dog at the time and their particular style of trimming. Uh, there was a time when this fall was kept quite full and there was a definite curve there front to back. Then uh, there was a time when this was the only difference between a Lakeland head trim and a Welsh or Airedale head trim was that they left hair between the eyes, but it was very short and hard and kind of straight down. Uh, to my way of thinking, since you're not looking for a hard bitten, intense look, you're looking for that mischievous kind of, okay, now what are we going to do? Uh, I like a little softer line. And uh, so I like a bit of a curve, but I want it filled in so that it's not stop, not blowing in the breeze. So I'm somewhere in between. Now you comb this forward and over the bridge of the nose, you don't want anything sticking out beyond the where the leather of her nose begins. And so that's from the top, that's pretty easy. You just trim it straight across and then you shape it down into the whiskers and just kind of blend it in. And on the whiskers, uh, you just take the very longest stuff on the tips. Now, on a short head like this, and I'm not saying your head's too short, but it's a short head. Uh, you're going to let her have, within reason, a little bit of length. If you've got a long-headed dog, remember, moderation. Uh, be willing to keep this quite short. You don't want this big long beard sticking out in front of their nose when their foreface is already too long. That's not the look you're going for. You want to bring it back into proportion a bit. So don't let these whiskers get real long. Now on her, you look at this and you say, hey, this is wispy and there's still some longer stuff there. Don't you want to trim that? Not yet. Be patient. You're not going to get the finished product today. So just chill. And again, where he's fine on the sides, but it's this that uh, I object to. So it's this that I'm going to shorten. Uh, this dog has very nice head planes. Uh, with his size. You know, his head is in balance with the rest of his body. He's a big dog. Uh, 
but as I pointed out last night, that does not mean that he's useless. Uh, but you take into account his size and substance. Now, that does not mean that uh, you breed into the fine-boned bitch and you're going to get dogs with proper bone. Um, you take into account the fact that he's got a variety of sizes and stuff behind him. Uh, you'll find out what he's dominant for in his first couple of litters and recognize that if you breed the small fine-boned bitch to him, you're going to get some of each. Um, if you're lucky, very lucky, uh, you may introduce some moderation in there as well and you got to be smart enough to recognize the moderation as it uh, comes up and work then with that. So yeah, you're way ahead breeding moderate to moderate, but you uh, even in those moderate dogs, size is something in this breed, and that's not something I pointed out last night, and is also a factor in judging and breeding these dogs. Size in Lakeland Terriers does not breed true. You can establish size within a given line, and that will breed, tend to breed true, but big does not always produce big, little does not always produce little. Uh, I was really fortunate when I got started in Lakelands. My first stud dog was a dog not unlike this. Uh, he was a magnificent dog, incredibly sound and beautifully coated. Had a wavy coat though, uh, but he was a gore. I mean, you could, he had, his coat was cast iron, and you could keep him in coat forever. Uh, then, on the flat work, flat work is head, chest, going gradually longer into the sides of the neck and the shoulders, and then the butt. Call it flat work because hey, hair's supposed to be short and flat. Um, I trim that, if I'm working a coat, I trim that at least once a week. Uh, can you get by with less often? Well, yeah, you can get by, but it's not going to be as smooth. Uh, as long as the dog has even a decent coat, uh, if you trim on this every week, as the old adage is, trim them when they don't look like they need trimming. If you wait until they look like they need trimming, you've waited too long. Uh, if you've got a, a dog with a heavy, really good heavy coat, dense coat, uh, and you want them looking really sharp, you'd better be prepared to trim on them a couple of times a week and go over the flat work. I, I know when Margie was showing Flirt, she used to say, I've got to trim this bitch between the breed and the group. <laughs> uh, she grew hair. And when you've got a very active coat that's being worked all the time, you'll trim them and you say, wow, perfect, whoa, have I, am I good? And you look at them a couple hours later and you're like, what did you do, dog? And they never grow it where you want it, only where you don't. So uh, don't wait until you look at them and say, ooh, you're looking shaggy, dog. I better get on you. Um, 